Ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between, look at me, the production values have gone through the roof. I am now primitively animated. How wonderful. I want to thank my good comrade. I'm me, you're an octago. Hopefully I'm saying that right because, wow, that's kind of a weird name. But hey, here's his channel. He does reviews and stuff and he's a pretty nifty dude. But nevertheless, welcome to Overanalyzed Adventures. And for today, I got a brand spanking new adventure game for you. I know it's shocking. It is known as The Slaughter, Act 1. And believe it or not, there is no voiceover work in this game. So that means the only voice you're gonna hear is my melodious and sexy voice. Woo. Can you handle it, folks? Can you handle it? So the game starts off with a simple, albeit perfectly functional, menu screen. And just a black background with all the important bits clearly visible and no music to speak of. Perfectly functional, so let's start the game. And here's all the tutorial we're gonna get. But then again, the controls are exactly what you would expect in a point-and-click adventure game. Oh, wonderful, we finally got music now. And just to forewarn you guys, I am not gonna read aloud all the text for you. In fact, I'm not gonna read any text for you, really. I'm just gonna summarize and give you the gist of what's going on in the game and point out anything that I find amusing. So the game takes place in London 130 odd years ago, and while we don't know it yet, we are that character on the ground who's getting the snot kicked out of him by that big dude, and then that little dude over there, well, he's actually a child I think, I don't think he's a little person, but I'm kind of iffy about it, but I'm pretty sure he's like a prepubescent boy who's also a mobster and runs a bunch of casinos and has this big dude as his muscle, so you gotta wonder how all this works out. But hey, we're getting the crap kicked out of us now. How wonderful. And since this child gambling hustling mafioso keeps calling this guy on the ground Sydney, and since I can control his dialogue choices, I'm pretty sure our hero's name is Sydney. Yeah, we get pleasant musical cues whenever we get the crap beaten out of us. And speaking of pleasant things, I rather enjoy the graphics in this game. Nice big sprites, sure maybe a bit on the simplistic side, but they're appealing at least to my eyeballs. So alright, this is all I know about the character so far. His name's Sidney, and he's a private investigator in Victorian London. And he's come the wrong side of this little mafioso. Well how did that happen you ask? Well, let's let the little mafioso explain. Yeah, so that's the explanation we're going with here. Sydney showed up in this little boy's dream, and the little boy got mad, so now he's beaten up Sydney. Okay, okay. I'm sure there's more to these guys' history than, well, just dreaming about one another. But yeah, it's just still kind of pathetic that here we are, a big time private eye, and we're being beaten up by a thug that belongs to a child. And oh yeah, we're not gonna get out of this one without some help, because you know, we're that type of protagonist. Again, really nice sound design. It's a shame there isn't enough sound in this game. But nevertheless, as you would expect, it's not the Ripper. Otherwise, this game would only be 10 minutes long. Instead, it's some pleasant prostitute. Yes, she is a lady of the night that's here to save our hero because she's altruistic. You know, the hooker with the heart of gold. After all, it's a private eye story. We have to get all of our cliches out of the way as quickly as possible. I'm pretty sure this guy's also an alcoholic and can't pay his rent and, well, probably has an ex-wife or something like that. So our hero, bruised and broken, tells this lady where he lives and then we get, well... I'm gonna call it the introduction movie. I don't know what else to call it. Roll credits now, I guess, if you wanted to. Yeah, that's all the credits we get. One man made this game. 
Nice effort all around. Again, I like the animation, I like the graphics in this game, the sound design's pretty good when it's there, but yeah, this is just an introduction scene. And the hooker's all like, oh, tell me about yourself, and our hero's like, I got the snot beat out of me by a child, I don't feel like talking. And then eventually our protagonist makes his way to, I guess, where she lives. One thing I'm gonna point out right now is that this game has a very, very slow start. The first 20 minutes or so of this game, you don't do nothing. All you get is a bunch of dialogue dumped on you from characters you don't know nothing about. Frankly, kinda dull. I suppose if I knew a thing or two about these characters, maybe I'd be interested in them, but frankly I just met these people, and all I know is they just wanna keep talking, and talking, and talking, and really saying nothing of importance. I guess the game's just trying to establish that, yes. This prostitute's a very nice person, and yes, this guy's a jaded private detective. That's really all we need to get from this scene that goes on for quite a while. So after talking for a while, our hero's exhausted and decides to go to sleep. And then we're introduced to the first moments of gameplay in this game. Well, this is just surreal. And talk about an interesting way to start off your gameplay, and no, that's not sarcasm. It's genuinely interesting. We're trapped in a lucid dream, and we have to escape it by solving a puzzle. And this happens throughout this game. I'm not sure what they really mean to the plot, but they're definitely visually interesting. The puzzles are usually pretty simple. Basically, you look around the room, then you find one item, and use it on one other item, and boom, you stop dreaming. It may lack substance, but at least it's visually interesting and kind of surreal. I guess this developer has watched some Twin Peaks in his day. <laughs> So our hero is rudely awoken from his slumber by a bang on the door. Although it makes him wonder, could he have been stirred from that lucid dream by the banging? Like, if I didn't solve the puzzle in a timely manner, would the banging cause him to wake? And we would have never have experienced that sequence where we put the slide into the slide projector and saw the prostitute, and then, well, that kind of was it. I guess the game's really trying to stress that yes, our private investigator really, really likes that red-headed prostitute. A lot. But lucid dreaming aside, it turns out the popo's at the door for some reason. Why? I don't know. They're just the popo. They do what they do. And naturally, we have to escape this room because I guess we don't want to be caught by the popo for reasons that are never really explained. I don't know what's going on here, but all I know is we need to get dressed and escape through a fire escape. Which we do rather easily by pouring some lamp oil on a rusty lock and, well, that causes the lock to work again. Hey, maybe that lamp was filled with whale oil. That stuff's nice and greasy, right? So after a brief spout of physical comedy, we get another animated sequence. And I suppose now's as good a time as any to talk about one little issue I had with this game. And that issue is its tone. On the one hand, this game wants to be a dark and disturbing tale about Jack the Ripper with some ultraviolence. But on the other, it wants to be a lighthearted, funny adventure game. It's kind of jarring how these tones just suddenly shift throughout the game. I mean, seriously, there's moments where there's something funny and then it's followed by boom, something violent and kind of disturbing. It's a bit strange, but hey, maybe you'll appreciate it more than I. Did. And to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't necessarily dislike it. I just found it to be kind of, well, jarring. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the transitions could be a bit smoother between moments of comedy and moments of, well, violence and horror. So with all that said, we're now home, or our office slash home thing. Hey, we're a private investigator, of course we live in our office. But nevertheless, we got the game's first quest, and that's to find this dog. I know it's not obvious, but seriously, that's all we gotta do now, is get washed up and leave and try to find this dog, because guess what? We're a broke private eye and we need the money. And I wasn't joking around about the washing up bit. We actually have to find some soap and use it on the sink and get washed up before we can leave and find the stray dog and collect the reward money. <laughs> A 
a yes, our protagonist does not know the name of the redheaded lady that he is infatuated with. And also, too, there's a peephole in this guy's bathroom. It's kind of disturbing. But yeah, it's most definitely there. But peepholes aside, we can finally leave this area and go find a dog. Yeah, um, this is the guy's landlord. No doubt he's the one who drilled the peephole in the bathroom because, well, he's a Victorian gentleman who prefers other Victorian gentlemen. And naturally he has a thing for our hero, who is of course behind on his rent. Yeah, as I brought up earlier, this game has a bit of a bizarre tone. And yeah, I totally forgot about Jack the Ripper. So hurrah to our protagonist, he almost got sexually harassed by his landlord, but hey, now he's in the park to find a dog. Because I guess this is the park that all the dogs go to. Who are we to judge? Victorian England was a wacky and crazy time. Oh, we just found the dog. He or she is in this leaf pile. We just gotta coax it out somehow. I know it's an incredibly easy puzzle. And to be perfectly honest with you, a lot of the game's puzzles are pretty simple. Not to say it's a bad thing, cause all we really need to do here is pick up a stick we find in the ground, and then walk over to another area and find a guy who's selling jellied eels, and then buy one from him. Because apparently we don't keep money in our inventory. But hurrah to us, we actually have some cash on us. I thought we were flat broke. But hey hoot, we go ahead and put the jellied eel on the stick, and we got the dog. But oh no, we can't take the dog with us because I guess we refuse to pick it up. I don't know, maybe we're allergic. So we have to find a rope somehow. And oh, look over here. There's a couple of children who are playing on the swing. And then we just go ahead and use the swing and it breaks. And yeah, we got a rope and you can probably figure out the rest from here. Again, not terribly challenging. So our hero rather conveniently develops a case of Butterfingers and the dog escapes down an alley where a murder has happened. And yeah, no one stops the dog from interfering with a crime scene. And when we try to go after it, the police are like, no, a murder happened here by Jack the Ripper and not laying you by. So we lost the dog. We never see it again. It's gone forever. But I guess we needn't worry about it because the dog was kind of like a tutorial sequence. And now we're finally really getting into the meat of the game. The whole murder investigation thing. Although it's not really obvious now because again, we can't really do any investigating because the area is all blocked off and everything's shut down. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't know why this scene's necessary. All we can do here is talk to people, and they don't really say much of anything except, oh my god, there was a murder here, and it's really obvious that Jack the Ripper did it. So anyway, after talking to enough people, you can finally leave the area, and well, again, a bit of comedy happens. Ah, the bird pooped on him. So anyway, as I mentioned before, our hero is a stereotypical private eye. So since he's having a bad day, he's headed down to his local pub to drown his sorrows in sweet, delicious alcohol. So I have no idea at what time he entered this bar. I'm going to assume midday. So he's been drinking here for hours. At least that's the impression I'm getting. Well, clearly our hero's drunk now because we got this whole wobbly line, squiggly thing going on with our screen now. Oh, I guess our hero just needed some fresh air because the whole wobbly line thing's gone now. He must be sobering up. That's pretty good. Maybe we could actually get to some investigation now and oh, oh dear.
Well, this has been a hell of an introduction to this game. What do you think is going to happen next time here on Overanalyzed Adventures? I don't know. We're going to find out together, though. All right, hopefully I'll see you next time, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between. Have a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening.